All right, well, we're just after one o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're really proud and excited to have Scott Nolly with us today. He is a conservator, exhibits loans for the Smithsonian, and uh, he's gonna share with us his expertise as we understand the art world and all of its interesting myths and intriguing art. So with that, um, we'll have Scott go ahead and start. If you've got any questions, he's gonna present first, and then at the end, we'll save some time for questions. So just type your questions into the chat and we'll make sure to take care of them at the end. Scott, let's hear you what you have to tell us today. Good afternoon, everybody. I was really thrilled to be asked to make this presentation. Um, art conservation has been a career for me since the late 70s. It almost hurts to say that out loud. Um, but it's, it's a craft and a science that takes place largely behind um, closed doors in museums and in private studios. So I love having the opportunity to sort of share details and aspects of the magic and the technique with, um, with the public at large. Um, it has, art conservation was always uh, sort of a secret science. It happened in the top floors of museums and in um, studios off of public view. And it's only recently that we have had conservation come into the public view. Um, the, the sort of benchmark project that pops to mind is the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Um, it took place in a controversial environment uh, in the early 90s. Um, it subverted an entire body of uh, art historical PhD paperwork. Uh, one quote that pops to mind was Michelangelo is a dark and brooding personality as evidenced by his somber and dark palette. And of course, the cleaning of the ceiling revealed that he actually had a talent for colorism and a rather dramatic delivery of his imagery. Um, it also brought to the public eye, it sort of highlighted the precise and technical combination of old school restorative techniques with the new analytical chemistry uh, observations that were combined with restoration to create what is now art conservation. Now art conservation combines two disciplines, basically restoration, which is the physical repair of an object aimed at returning it to uh, its appearance or structure as it was after it was fabricated. And more importantly to us in the museum industry, preservation, the actual act of getting in between agents of deterioration, such as temperature, humidity, acid rain, by taking preventative measures to, um, to secure that these artworks endure and don't go through the significant changes that, for instance, corrosion and deterioration can bring. And it's proven to be uh, a very successful endeavor. This is a painting from a collection at a university in Virginia that actually fell off the wall in one of the faculty residences and was found behind a refrigerator uh, about 40 years after the damage occurred. And you can see that the painting had torn, the painting had a significant amount of surface dirt and grime plus the usual discolored varnish. And with the appropriate administration of restoration techniques and, um, and analytical chemistry, we were able to return this painting to a reasonable uh, image of its original execution. So the, the impulse to repair cultural property and historic objects is, is moored in some very uh, basic human impulses. Uh, it's easier to repair an object and often much more economically advantageous to do that than to have one recreated from whole cloth or whole stone in this instance. And that really brought about moreover the restoration component of art conservation. You see here missing parts being fabricated and replaced. This is actually a modern gesture but 
we see this a lot in a lot of antiquities and a lot of aged historic artifacts that restoration crept in to compensate for loss in a number of these artifacts. Now these losses come about as an artwork is, or a um, work of cultural property is uh, exposed to what we call agents of deterioration. The minute that a artist or a fabricator lifts his hand from the creation of an object, uh, the, the laws of thermodynamics creep in, temperature, humidity, and just the, the ravages of age creep in and start to take their toll on these materials. This was really never more evident than during World War II when the Nazis uh, sequestered a lot of their cultural property stolen from museums and private collections in salt mines in Austria. And the damp environment, the chlorides that were presented by the actual salt in the mines took their toll on a number of these artifacts. Um, you may have seen or heard the stories of the Monuments Men, which were part of a British initiative, the British Special Operation ex uh, ex Executive Mission, I believe it was, that was formed with the American military to, to identify and secure these works. And a lot of the men who were tapped for this position were actually scientists. And those scientists came back to this country and are responsible for the formation of a lot of the academic programs in art conservation in the country that we know today. And why was this important? The application of science to these uh, preservation and restorative measures. Um, in the past, the cleaning of artwork and cultural property was largely an effort of housekeeping. As you can imagine, even the best of intentions using these methods is not in the best interest of, for instance, here, a painted religious icon. So this has sort of grown into educational programming. There are a number of dedicated graduate and undergraduate programs in the United States that teach preservation, restoration as conservation. Uh, the classes are kept very small, intense in their dispensation of information. Um, it's also crept into the scientific industry where we've come up with technical methods for analyzing artwork, which allow us to sort of understand what materials are being used and, um, and how to best treat these artworks. Now, artwork and cultural property are interesting entities because they are emotional touchstones, they are historic touchstones, and people have their own individual relationships with these objects. A perfect example uh, is the restoration of Rembrandt's The Mill, this paintings at the National Gallery. When the painting was restored, the removal of the yellow varnish that revealed the artist's original intent caused a total furor. People considered the painting ruined, changed beyond repair, when actually all that had been done was a removal of hundreds of years of the accumulation of yellow varnish and dirt. These gestures, these cleaning gestures, these restoration gestures are skill set driven and they're also personality driven in a lot of ways. Uh, each project takes on a tone informed by the level of expertise of the practitioner. And at the same time, it's hard to understand what an individual in the position of doing this work actually sees. And one of the most noteworthy public examples is this. I think everybody's seen this on CNN. Um, this is a restoration that was carried out in uh, Spain, I believe. And the end product is on the far right. And the person who did the work was actually fairly satisfied with the end result. But I think we can clearly see that the skill set and the ability to see and assess the ultimate gesture here speaks to how variable the, um, the result can be. 
And why is this important? Well, over time with objects that have significant histories, um, we can lose sight of the artist's intent and we can come to know an object totally askew from what its original appearance may have been. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples and we're gonna walk through why the appearance, why the ability to assess appearance and authenticity are important in understanding particular artifact material. This is a portrait of Ryland Randolph, and this is in the Wilton House Museum in Richmond, Virginia. It was painted by John Wollaston. He was an itinerant painter in the mid 1700s in this country. He came to the colonies looking for a career in portrait painting. And it was in vogue here in the colonies as everyone in the colonies wanted to emulate British house culture. And a large part of that was documenting families with portraiture. He was a smart guy, he was a, a businessman and he secured his place in colonial portrait history by painting the social and the political glitterati of the day. He really knew, he painted Washington's family, Lee's family, Jefferson's family. But this is one of those outstanding examples. It stands outside of his body of work as being incredibly colorful, masterful, and full of personality of the sitter. When we first encountered this painting, um, it was delivered to our studio looking like that. And that appearance is the result of six complete campaigns of repainting as we can best figure over the course of 200 years. The painting was given to Wilton by a member of the Randolph family, a descendant, and described as a painting of Ryland Randolph by John Wollaston. And as you can imagine with this appearance, it looked like neither. It looks very much like a colonial revival, 1920s copy of a colonial portrait. So part of the process of determining what you're looking at when you see something that is this muddled is uh, an analytical approach. And the first thing we did was we took x-rays of the painting, literally an x-ray like you might have taken of a broken bone. And what we see here is the original portrait image beneath all of those layers of paint and the dark fleck areas that you see here, here and here are where the x-rays make it all the way through the painting to the film. So we know there are losses there, that there's actually missing paint. But no, by no means are these losses large enough to, to prompt the global repainting of the portrait image. So we decided to go ahead and open up windows over the surface of the painting to see what was underneath and basically removing the complex layers of overpaint and we started to get an appearance of the original portrait like this. So after a complete cleaning and the small areas of loss being filled and in-painted, literally color applied only in areas of loss so that as much of the original image could remain exposed, we came up with the painting here. So what you have is an example of well-intended administration of restorative technique, probably by six different people with six different skill sets, uh, originally addressing only small damages, but escalating into these global repaintings of the portrait image. So it's, it's a well-intended assault on a painting that in the, ultimately delivered an image that was indecipherable from the original. And it's, they're not all necessarily uh, that dramatic. This next example is a painting. You see the two of them side by side, give you an idea of the dramatic difference. This next painting is a seventh, late 17th, early 18th century portrait of a French noblewoman. It has an interesting story associated with it. The owner, it's an ancestor portrait for its owner who tracked it down at a, a state sale in Northern Maryland. And 
it too had been restored, but to what degree was difficult to determine. And the real uh, key to deciphering what we were looking at came from a production designer for a film. The production designer for the HBO series, John Adams, was in the studio. And he took a look at the painting and he said, her hair is all wrong for the period. Now that's not a level of expertise for me, but for somebody who defines costuming and hairstyles for period films, that is their area of expertise. So leading with that information and certainly the same kind of analytical work that took place with the Ryland Randolph painting, we opened up a few windows by removing the accumulation of overpaint and we could see how the hairstyle had been sort of trimmed down. And this was probably driven by a sense of fashion rather than just simply well-intended restoration. Somebody, you get the impression that somebody decided the hair was just a bit too much and they didn't want the portrait hanging in their house. So they had the painting repainted, not six layers of retouching here, but one single layer of paint correcting this hairstyle or quote unquote correcting this hairstyle to the then owner's liking. And that was the original hairstyle. So you can see, I can see how that might be a little too exuberant for a turn of the century dining room or a turn of the century living room. But the choice was made to literally alter that image uh, to the liking of whoever was making the decision at the time. And so in that sense, historically, our understanding of this sitter and the fashion and the details were altered considerably um, with we're presuming um, an intention to correct the painting to the owner's liking rather than just sort of well-intended accumulations of restoration. So you see there are logics that can inform these processes that are lost to time just as much as some of the imagery can be. Now, when it comes to intent, it's hard to decipher whether changes to cultural property and artwork are being carried out for nefarious reasons or just simply an environment of ignorance. And there was an exhibit that was mounted in the early 90s by the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art called Discovery and Deceit. And at the core of this exhibition was the desire to unravel this combination of previous repair restoration, what we're seeing, and summoning analytical technique to parse between uh, authentic examples of cultural property and then known forgeries. And what was interesting during the course of this exhibition, um, using analytical technique, we were able to identify campaigns of previous repairs. You see a lot of pens here, staples. It's actually a cut marble replacement to the sculpture's head here. And a number of artifacts that were in the known forgery column and the artifacts that were in the known genuine examples column actually through this analytical work changed station. And we found that some things that were thought to be original examples were actually forgeries and vice versa. So this exhibit brought to the public that kind of thinking, the rationale of how we arrive at understandings of intended alteration to artwork for nefarious reasons or just accumulations of repairs that sort of blur our sight for these individual artifacts. One example in this exhibition was this uh, Hellenistic gold bracelet. It was a star in the crown of the collection. And we were comparing it with a number of known examples around the world. Now, it helps to understand how these pieces are created. And traditionally, sheet metal, sheet gold metal, would have been hammered into molds that formed the shape into the resulting contours of, for instance, 
the images of the ram's head, the ears, and even some of the broader designs throughout the piece. Wire is another dead giveaway in these jewelry pieces. The traditional Greco-Roman techniques for making wires were to take cylinders of metals and roll them with knives to give them beads or a bead-like shape, or to take strips of metal and twist them into sort of a pretzel strand that would give them these various patterns and result in decorative wires. So we took a look at this patterning under an electron microscope. And the genuine examples, you can see them here, are these grooved beaded wires and these twisted ribbons that you see here. Very characteristic shapes, all very specific to the fabrication technology of the time, which was about 300 BC. When we took the ram's head bracelet and put it under an electron microscope, this is what the wire looked like. And this is characteristic of what we call extruded wire, wire that's literally pressed out of um, a tip like a pastry bag, or for instance, uh, making pasta. You can actually see pinched ends to each of the wire, which would be the result of, for instance, a pair of wire cutters. And wire of this manufacturer, known as drawn wire, has only been around since the uh, 1100s. Wire is made by hand when it's drawn through a plate. This is a, a image from Northern India, where ingots of metal are pushed through funnel-like shapes in steel plates. And in this method, wire is made. There are various plates. This is a French image uh, showing how wires could be shaped into round wire, elliptical, square, and they're pulled through these plates which are, which are with what are called a pair of drawing tongs. Another dead giveaway here was we knew a, of a number of post-World War II um, forgers in the area, in the Greek Isles, who also were jewelry makers. And this rosette pattern was the family insignia of a jewelry making firm called Dimitriou. And every piece of jewelry that Dimitriou made, the modern offerings of his jewelry shop, were characterized by these florets. And so evidently the Dimitriou family were uh, unable to sublimate their ego or their sense of pride in fabricating jewelry. So even when forging these period pieces, they couldn't restrain themselves from including the family rosettes. So now when you go into the Metropolitan Museum or you go into another museum and you see Greek jewelry, if you see these floral rosettes, you will know that this is something that came out of the Dimitriou family studios. So there you have an example of someone who found a market post-World War II to actually uh, create a product and name it as something that it wasn't. So this is you know, basically the forger's technology. And viewing these things, seeing these things through the lens of uh, analysis and connoisseurship hasn't changed that much over time. Um, it's all in the act of seeing. It's all in the act of being educated to know what you're looking at. And the advantage we have today are these analytical techniques and the technical machinery to actually focus the human eye in a different language and a different perspective uh, when examining these works of art and cultural property. And it gets more and more complicated these days as industry creates various materials, plastics, uh, new alloys and metal, and artifacts expand the market. The charge of a conservator, a curator, to know what they're looking at, to understand the history of any particular body of information continues to grow and continues to be a challenge. And 
far be it from conservators to tell artists what they can and cannot do, we end up finding ourselves faced with even more challenging, um, <laughs> if not sometimes ridiculous problems to deal with. Uh, this is, for instance, a Mona Lisa executed in peanut butter and jelly. So you see there, it's an ever expanding vocabulary and uh, legacy of cultural property. And as a conservator, we're tasked with keeping up with materials and methods and being challenged in ways to preserve these specific uh, cultural touchstones. So there you have it, a brief outline. Do you guys have any questions? Hi, uh, yes, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one here is, uh, uh, how frequently do you find a forge in a, a forgery in a loan exhibit? Um, usually when an institution is called upon to borrow or lend an object, they've been subject to the scrutiny of curators subject to the scrutiny of uh, conservators and a lot of uh, intentional forgery or uh, misnamed artifact material has already been parsed through at that point. I mean, we see more uh, forged material in private sector, in the private markets. Um, I know a lot of tourists who go to China and come back happy that they have um, secured for themselves a Tang Dynasty horse or a Tang Dynasty sculpture. And a lot of those are fabricated modern examples. What's interesting about the Chinese market, for example, though, is the Chinese are very smart about uh, the interest in this particular genre of material. They will use period molds, for example, Tang Dynasty era molds to create new examples of these forms. And um, there was a time where uh, an analytical technique known as, um, oh gosh, I can't remember. As, uh, it was a luminescence technique used to date ceramics. And once the Chinese discerned that we were using this technique to date ceramic material, they started going into medieval villages and crushing roof tiles from the medieval period and using them to cast these Tang dynasty forms so that they actually dated analytically the correct date. So it's in the private sector that you see this fluidity of material that is more often forged or uh, reproduction or period reproduction. Uh, usually in privileged environments such as museums, we don't really see a lot of that. It's not unheard of because anytime somebody requests a loan object or mounts an exhibition for um, a specific body of material, they receive renewed attention. And at that time, it's the current technology that's possible. It's the current literature that's consulted. So every time an object is reconsidered in a new light, in a new temporal context, there is the potential for making that kind of discovery. It's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. It's a cool one. Uh, does your team do a lot of restoration and what is the most complicated part of it? Um, restoration really is a tricky, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. We, these days, the emphasis is on preservation because the gesture of restoration can at times do what you've seen in some of these previous slides. It can actually blur original information so that they do not read or do not convey as the genuine artifact. So restoration is selective. It takes place much more in the fine arts than it does in other areas because for instance, a painting is intended to be a window on an illusory world. And that illusion from two dimension to three dimension often requires um, adjustments to damage artifacts. Uh, so the judgment call may very well be the answer to what's the trickiest part. We have all kinds of materials and techniques that we can summon into the service of following through in the restoration and preservation gestures. Um, 
conservation, as you can imagine, does not provide an enormous market draw for uh, any particular material. So the onus on conservators and conservation scientists is to go and explore different sectors for potential new materials. And then we, we leave no stone unturned. We go to, for instance, the cosmetic industry for, uh, for different gums and emulsions and systems of that sort. We go to the food industry for uh, polymers and cellulosic materials, for instance. There's a, a material that they use in the food industry to improve the strength of hot dog bun hinges so that they actually hold together when you fold them. And that is a cellulosic material that is often used in paper conservation. So, you know, it's, it's about amassing your arsenal of approved and tried and true materials and summoning them in service of the uh, virtuosity of these historic artifacts. Very interesting. Um, I've got another one. It goes back to forgery. And the question is, have you ever found a forgery that surprised an owner? Has that ever been something that you've had to, to say yes. to someone? Yes, indeed. In fact, the Tang Dynasty example that I gave you was, um, was an actual conversation that I had over the course of a year with someone who traveled to China, was very proud of themselves that they came back with this Tang Dynasty figure. They said it came with a certificate of authenticity, and yet it dated, it dated appropriately, but it didn't look quite right. The surface was not quite what you would expect. And at the same time, um, a scientist at the Getty Institute in California had studied uh, the dating of these particular figures and had found out about the Chinese roof tile incident. And ceramic that's been fired under a microscope looks very different than crushed material that has been cast in a mold. And he, he, he characterized the uh, cast material, he said it looks like crushed brick tapioca because they had actually mixed this ground roof tile material with some kind of mineral binder. And the mineral binder is uh, basically the active ingredient in magic rocks, if you know the sort of rocks that you put in a peanut butter jar and they grow in the liquid that they supply. That was the binder silica gel. Wow. Well, that was a hard conversation, I'm sure, for that person. Here's another one. It's kind of a long question, but I will say it to you. Um, how proactive are conservators in entering an area of conflict or social disruption? In what kind of condition do they enter? Um, think you may be accompanied by a guard or uh, someone who's from the military. Uh, the monument men from w World War II, in this case, um, have there been other expeditions during uh, conflicts, such as when the Taliban destroyed temples, which was about a decade ago? That's an ongoing concern. There are a lot of different uh, parties involved, and it usually is, again, sort of the, the, the programming and the teams are put together on an incident by incident basis. As you can imagine, there's a lot of politics that surrounds that, um, what countries they take place in, what the artifact materials involved are, are they religious or secular? Um, UNESCO can become involved uh, if there are concerns uh, that are intercultural, the governments become involved. Uh, there's a lot on the website for the American Institute of Conservation, if you're interested, or the International Institute of Conservation, AIC and IIC, who very often summon teams will put out a, 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 an all points bulletin and try and get conservators to put together teams to go and intervene in some of these environments. And it, um, it's on a case by case basis. It happens all the time. And the United States is a big torchbearer in that concern. We do a lot of work abroad in preserving other countries' uh, precarious cultural heritages. Very good. Uh, we've got another one here. It's, if you have a private client, especially one with very expensive object, how do you manage their expectation when it comes to restoration? Are they sometimes disappointed after it's restored because they unwittingly became attached to the unrestored version? I, I've had people walk into the studio and walk by their 
paintings before, not even recognizing them sometimes, even though conversations up to that point have been had in an effort to make very clear what the expectations of the outcome should be. Um, it is, it's definitely a not insignificant component of a dialogue with a client. You have to make sure they understand what they're looking at, what you're proposing to undertake, and what those outcomes may be. And a lot of times there is a range, there's a latitude there where it's uncertainty. And you say, we are embarking on this journey and this and this and this may happen. This and this and this may be what you can expect. And it's rare that you're so completely surprised by the outcome. I mean, the, the Ryland Randolph portrait, for example, that's about as dramatic an example as it gets. And yet through the x-rays and through the selective uh, cleaning tests, we had some sense and expectation of what we would get to in the end. Uh, and in the same round, it says, what are the materials and methods that are used to remove layers of paint on an old painting? And how do you not remove the original paint? It's interesting, part of this formal training, this intensive formal training in art conservation is chemistry and chemical engineering. You are taught um, interactions of materials, the capacity for certain cleaning chemistries. Um, you also have to understand fabrication technologies. So when you come to the point where you are actually interacting with an artifact in the removal of painting, or in the removal of previous restoration. You understand the period in which the object was created. You understand what materials were used and what their tolerances are or might be for treatment methodology. Um, if, you're, if it's been restored in the past, what were those materials? How have they aged and what did they use? And you end up sort of what we think of as retro synthetically, just going backwards into the history of the object and unraveling it so that we have a comprehensive knowledge of what it takes to, to reverse old treatment work and to affect a stable and enduring restoration. And the choice of the materials is informed by that entire process because one of the ethical considerations that contemporary conservators bring to the table is our gesture should be readily identifiable from the original artifact material and easily reversible if not retreatable in the future. So we end up using what we fa familiarize as class A materials, uh, mineral pigments, things that are basically appropriate and will not interact with the original artifact in any sort of destructive way. So it's a complicated constellation of decision-making, I guess. And uh, in art exhibits that we would see at a, a, any major museum, would those uh, all have been restored or, or what are we usually seeing when we go to a museum? It's, you can never say never, but artifacts of significant age have almost always been addressed by someone's hand, um, whether it be informed or, uh, for instance, musical instruments go to musical instrument makers for repairs. Um, paintings very often before paintings conservators were known and understood as a, as a discipline, paintings went to other painters for repair. So, it's a mixed bag as to who does what work um, along the timeline of the life of an object. So when you go into a museum, you can pretty much count on the fact that some restoration or conservation work has been done to almost everything that's there. If not purely for the reason of preventative conservation and preservation. Um, I can say that one of the few places I've ever been where I thought things were, I wouldn't say largely untouched, but struck me as being incredibly fresh and enduring were uh, in Windsor Castle, the galleries in Windsor Castle, 
because a lot of those paintings and a lot of those sculpture came into that collection and have gone nowhere else since. As opposed to paintings you might see in a museum, which have been subject to a cycle of resale, reacquisition, treatment for resale, reacquisition over the years. And it is that cycle of um, being freshened up for resale or, or traveling through galleries that creates the opportunity for a work to be treated or to be restored. Um, I got another one that's pretty interesting. The art conservati conservatory is such a broad and encompassed so many different fields, history, science, and knowledge of materials, and the artistic talents of the conservator. Do conservators specialize in certain eras and cultures to manage uh, the breadth of knowledge necessary and the artistic techniques required for each period? That's a good question. And it's true that this has been one of the broader arcs of the profession. When I started studying back in the late 70s, you either decided on objects, paintings, or works on paper. It was sort of a three-legged stool. And each one of those areas uh, had very specific criteria for understanding their materials. Objects being, of course, the most general and uh, wide-ranging. Works on paper would have been understanding paper as a substrate, and then all of the various techniques that are used to put images or text on paper. And then paintings, of course, easel paintings, and then paintings on walls, the application of pigment in binder to surfaces. Since the NAGPRA Act, for example, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act in the 80s was passed um, by Congress, specialization in ethnographic artwork, oceanographic artwork, um, have been disciplines that have splintered off. We have textiles conservation now for costumes and fabrics. There's a discipline in photography. There's a discipline in video and time-based media. So as the field has expanded, there have been it, it very much in an, an analog to, for instance, medicine. You know, you're a general practitioner, but now you're a neurosurgeon and you're a neurosurgeon specializing in pediatrics. The same thing has happened to conservation. And that's one of the great things I tell students who want to get into the profession. It, the world is your oyster. If you pick a specific area of material and you want to make that your expertise, then you can do that because there are people out there who want their collections cared for. I have a friend whose specialty is Fabergé eggs, and there are a limited number of those out there, but that's what she does. She just does Fabergé eggs. We've got, um, it looks like just one more question, and it's more of a personal question. We have a viewer today who was gifted a piece of artwork and wants to be pointed in the right direction um, where she might be able to get it appraised. She lives in the DC metro area. I would contact a museum that has curatorial staff familiar with the object that you are inquiring about. Um, for conserv conservation and appraisal are a separation of church and state. Uh, we are tasked as conservators with treating cultural material and artwork without regard to intrinsic value. So that sort of takes us off the hook there. But the, uh, the craft of appraisal is its own area of expertise. There are market-driven decisions. Uh, you have to know the comparables, what things are going for at, at, at this particular time. Um, there are also the sort of logistics of understanding what a replacement value is versus the intrinsic value, which are all sort of in insurance terminologies. But I would go to a museum with a curatorial staff that is familiar with a body of work that would include your specific artifact and ask them for a recommendation. And sometimes they don't like to do that. They consider that an arm of the institution and they'll say, we're not allowed to give recommendations, comma, but. You know, so you can always ask and say, well, if, if you were going to take something of yours, for instance, you know, there's, there are ways around the linguistic, but I go to an expert from the curatorial side of the equation because they will probably have a better sense of how to do this first. Very good. Actually, it looks like we've got one more thing that popped up and it's, what is the oldest item that you have worked on? Oh gosh. 
Um, it was an early kingdom Egyptian ceramic. Um, and it was very interesting because I was an intern. I was a graduate intern and I was working at the Metropolitan and it was about the size of a tennis ball. It was a pinch pot, a ceramic pinch pot with a sort of rope pattern around the outside. And what really touched me was on the bottom, there were fingerprints, basically 5,000 year old fingerprints. And you realize you are simply just an extension of the human concern. This has been going on forever and things really haven't changed that much. That's really neat to be able to see ancient fingerprints and be able to know you're touching history. Uh, I think that's an awesome place to end. And Scott, we just want to thank you on behalf of everyone who watched today. Uh, thank you for uh, extending your expertise to us and talking to us about uh, the years of knowledge that you've gained through um, art conservancy and restoration. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for watching Scott today. Uh, we look forward to you joining us next week on Thursday at 1 p.m. as we look uh, for ourselves and our loved ones on the top 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's. Uh, but I hope you all have a great afternoon and, and thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon.